I think I should have been thinking more broadly about career opportunities before business school. Um, and, you know, I was living in San Francisco in the, you know, mid 2000s when like Google just went public and like, I was like one of the first Facebook users. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll be a consultant. I'll be a forensic accountant. <laughs> like that's fine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesse Lau. I am the head of product for a startup called Moxie. Um, I just started uh, quite recently, depending on when you when you saw this, so I don't have much to say about that <laughs> quite yet. But um, my background is that I was a consultant in a number of different industries for about a decade. I went to business school at Dartmouth Tuck, and, um, and I've worked in tech, both in startups and uh, at Amazon. Uh, let's talk about your career journey a little bit because you've had a really I think, interesting and varied career. You've been a yep. consultant, you went to business school, you did, I think, a little even more consulting, uh, maybe a slightly different type of consulting, and you uh, worked at a tech startup, and you worked as a product manager at a big company, and now you're doing a tech startup as like the head of product. Yeah, there's a lot of different steps there, and it, you a lot of different roles, and I, I'd love to like just unpack a little bit of that and understand what you were thinking as you went through each of those steps and learnings that you can share for people that might be earlier in their journey. So, I'll start with the sort of MBA step, which was I know you know we were in MBA school together. I'm curious, you went into consulting right after business school. Why did you decide to do that? Yeah, you know, it's actually, um, I made that decision before I went to business school. I was tired of the consulting that I was in pre-business school, and I applied to you know, Bain, BCG, McKinsey, and got, eat from each, um, you know, canned rejection letters. And I just felt like I was being blocked from that experience, and it felt like, looked like an experience that I wanted to have. Yeah. Um, and so, in fact, as I, as I, was in business school, I was so frankly, so dogmatically targeted towards consulting firms that I didn't even spend much time thinking about um, thinking about other industries. I think some of the reasons why um, uh, I, I think the 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 ability to explore a wide variety of industries um, was was exciting to me. Um, the ability to really understand up and down a PL how a business works was really interesting to me. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it was a prestigious job. So it was something that I'd feel proud of doing. Um, and, and those are, those are the, I think the primary reasons why I was excited about consulting. Do you think that like looking back on that now, like, should you have pushed yourself when you got into MBA to like, think about what else you, you could have explored or like was just heads down staying focused on that goal did that end up being the right thing i i think i should have been thinking more broadly about career opportunities before business school um and you know i was living in san francisco in the you know mid 2000s when like Google just went public and like I was like one of the first Facebook users and I was like <laughs> yeah I'll be a consultant I'll be a forensic accountant <laughs> like that's fine <laughs> right? so, like, this other stuff I, seems boring that's <laughs> like come on Facebook that's never gonna make it um, <laughs> you know I think that it's been a long road for me to um to be willing to explore other options that are that maybe are a little more risky right yeah. um and um and i was a, i was very risk averse at the start and i think consulting for someone who doesn't quite know what they want to do or who they want to be when they grow up um maybe feel a little bit of risk aversion i think consulting is a great job yeah. and i was it, it, it fit for me at the time that time in my life makes sense what did what was the most important lesson you learned as a consultant post business school yeah you know i was thinking about this and i learned a lot of like skills um, around, you know, Excel modeling and how to think about business and how to, um, how to like draw conclusions from, uh, really conflicting information. That stuff's really valuable. I use it all the time. 
the stuff that I've walked away from that is the most helpful to me today is, is around communication, how to communicate ideas in a way that um, is compelling to a party, compelling enough that you get them to change their behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I had a couple that I, I wrote to, I jotted down here before, before we started. And let me, let me talk about one in particular. Um, I remember I was in, I was in a meeting and a client asked a question and I didn't know the answer to the question. And so, but I knew some facts surrounding the question. So I started talking about those facts. Um, and then I stopped talking <laughs> and my, my boss like came to me right after the meeting and said like, your client was fuming mad that whole time because they asked you a question you didn't answer. And he said, you gave them a lot of great information, but you didn't answer their question, so they couldn't hear it. He said, when somebody asks you a question, if you don't know the answer, you say, I don't know the answer to that. Here's some information I do know, right? Or I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to go figure it out. Next question. And I found that to be freeing. Like, I no longer felt responsible to know every answer to every question. Um, and uh, it's I've used it all the time since then. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I, the other thing I'll add to it that I think why that tactic of like, hey, someone asked me question X and, and my immediate response is like, I don't know the answer to that. Here's some other relevant stuff you might be interested in is it's also extremely direct. So, but doesn't give them the rambly stuff first. They might be like, okay, I get you don't know it, but actually some of the interesting relevant stuff you mentioned is interesting to me. Tell me more. And yeah. then it's like a, a pull request from them mm -hmm. for more information, but you're not confusing them with, you know, a bunch of garble first. I, I feel exactly. like Bain, Bain, amazingly, I feel like Bain has branded this as like answer first, Yeah, uh, which is like, I think like some sort of magic trick that they imagine to take, just like answer things directly and brand it with their, their name. Um, but right. I do think there's like, because of the reason you mentioned, uh, I think it's an interesting idea of the concept of like, oh, that's actually freeing as well. Because like you can say like, hey, I don't know this, but like here's the other stuff I do know or I don't know and I, I'll go find out. That's like another, you know, like pretty acceptable answer yeah. in most cases, maybe not all cases. Like if someone told you you were supposed to know two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like then you start to look like an idiot if you just keep saying, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, it's freeing sense. when you know most of the other answers. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about you left consulting after was it four four years? Four, yeah, five? about 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 five years. Okay, so you did a decent stint because like a lot of folks post MBA, they do their two years and yeah. then they move on. So you did you yeah. did five years. Like, why at that point did you decide to move on, and why did you choose to go to a healthcare startup, which is which is where you ended up? Yeah. Um, so. I stayed longer because I wanted to make make it into the case team leader role. Um, that you know, as I look back on all the key things that I learned around communications, um, the case team leader role is the is the role in which you communicate the most, right? Like you are in charge. Um, you lead the meetings, you guide the teams. Um, and so, I wanted I wanted to have that specific experience. You know, the 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 longer the longer tenured you become, the harder it is to leave and find your next job. Um. So as as it, as I think about why I joined um my my first role, I was looking for a company that had uh the 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 kind of role I was looking for, like something that bridged the gap between consulting and 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 working in industry, which is oftentimes a strategy job or a biz ops job. Yeah. Um, so I had the kind of role at the at a level that felt like the right fit for me at, at that stage of my career. So um, I actually ended up falling into the healthcare space um, and specifically this um, med uh, medical aesthetics space. That that was the last, the industry was the last choice. You know, I had just spent five years bouncing around from industry to industry and finding myself like excited and engaged about all sorts of random stuff. So I didn't really necessarily care about the industry. I was I, I cared a lot about the role and the um, 
and the function. Got it. And what was, I know you held a, a couple different roles at Real Self. What, what was the, the first role that you were like, okay, this feels like the right bridge between consulting yeah. and food? Yeah, you know, I, I, I essentially joined as the head of strategy for the business. And um, the, what one finds in that role, I think generally, depending on the size of the business, is you are, um, if you, if you are joining without a, without an established strategy or biz ops team, you're going to be doing special projects that are interesting to your boss or the CEO um, that, nobody else is either capable of doing or has the time to do. Yeah. Um, They're and like so, the internal consultant that's like a smart brain generalist and like the CEO is like, hey, this is interesting, but I'm like doing all these other operating things. Can you research this? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I did all sorts of stuff. Um, the thing that I showed up, showed up and did really well immediately, and it's funny, you talked about Bain being magic. Like it felt like magic to me at the time. Like I showed up um, and the the team was right at the start, like my first week, they had just had like a board meeting that didn't go great. Um, and the board was like, you're not communicating this effectively. I don't know what to take away. I don't know how to answer you. Um, it, it was a bad conversation. And uh, <laughs> so somebody said like, next time, like write a very clear strategy and like, let's review that together. And so here I am, like, <laughs> like that's my job. So I showed up, I like took in <laughs> all of this disparate information. I output it into a coherent, clear strategy. I don't even know if I, if I ha had anything novel to say besides just like organizing the thinking that already existed. Probably today that would have been chat GPT, but um, like it, it, it worked and it felt like magic to them, right? Like it felt like, oh my God, this guy is brilliant. And, um, and so that, that really allowed me to like establish a, a, an important presence inside the organization. Yeah. Let's pause there for a second. Cause I do think there is something important about the skill set that a lot of people, I think, pick up in consulting happens in interviewing consulting certainly happens on the job, like day in, day out is, is just being able to like structure problems and then just communicate those problems in a structured way back to someone in the organization and like the knock on consultants is often like, well, you didn't do anything new. You just told us stuff we already knew. Right. But like, then like the flip side is like, they came in and structured all the information in a way that made it make sense and made it digestible and made it actionable and commute, like maybe, you know, that it could be communicated and socialized appropriately to the rest of an organization. It just like, it works and it sort of feels. Yeah like magic and that's like it's a yeah. little like cheesy to say it that way but it's like the flip side of like this is sort of why that industry i think to some extent like exists and thrives the the point about chat gpt being able to do some of that in the future is is an interesting one um <laughs> i you know i um I, I think it's a good point and it's interesting like i'll, I'll add on I'll, I'll fast forward just for a second i was in um I was in an interview later on with Amazon and um, they asked me, what's the most innovative thing you've ever done? And I said, I, I described something that was similar, right? That was not new, that was not innovative, um, that I sort of borrowed from other, from things I had seen in other industries and just customized it to our specific industry and medical aesthetics. And they, m my interviewer who ended up being my boss, she loved that answer. Right. I, and I started again, like really clearly saying some people might not consider this particularly innovative, but I found this to be super innovative because of A, B and C. And I think um, I think it's actually a red flag if you're looking at companies and they're, they, they only consider innovation to be things that are novel ideas. Um, I think that, that can be concerning. Like it, novel ideas are also innovative, but if that's the only way, then then you you might be spinning your wheels. Yeah. I mean, look at like one of the greatest tech companies and most innovative ones of all time, like Apple, it was, you know, helmed by jobs, like great artists steal. Like he literally talked about that all the time. Like you steal good ideas from other places and like steal is a little bit of a negative connotation, but the idea was like you get inspired and copy from, yeah. from different walks of life, from different 
that's the point. Yeah, like exactly. We combine things. Exactly. Um, cool. So, like, tell me. I, so, I know you ended up holding a bunch of different roles at, at at Real Self, and I think it sounded like even when you were initially making the switch from consulting in, like, it was not the end goal. It sounded like to like have a career as a strategy person in an in industry. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'm, maybe I'm reading in, but like. Yeah, I guess tell me about that. Was that the end goal of like, hey, I just want to, you know, rise up the ranks as a strategy person internally at a company? Or were you hoping that like, I'm going to transition, I'm going to use this as a bridge into some operating role? Yeah, yeah, no, it was always that I wanted to be an operator. And, you know, I think the flip side of the magic that I could bring by like, consolidating all the information and, and presenting it was, I still worked there the next day after I was done with the presentation. And, you know, a huge part of deploying good strategy, a very small part of it is thinking about it and writing it down. A very huge part of it is um, setting goals against it, making progress against it, holding yourself and other people accountable to it. And that I was not good at. Um, and it really, I, I don't know that I ever got good at it while I was at Real Self, um, but I, I I sought to challenge myself to do so by moving into increasingly more um, more operationally heavy roles. So did you end up moving into an operational role that was like trying to execute on some of that strategy that you helped codify initially? Yeah, I, I basically um, I basically took over um, an ad an ad sales team as the GM of an ad sales team that um, that essentially was you know, about 10 to 20% of how we monetize the business. So I, I sort of owned that, that part of the strategy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but um, cause I think this next transition is also very interesting. So you, you worked your way up to, I think a VP at real self running, running the ads business sounds like, and then you made a career switch and moved into product management at Amazon. The, the, yeah. like, there's a lot of interesting things about that. Like one, you, you know, switched from a very small company back to a very big company. You switched functions sort of from like a GM VP role to a product management role. Tell me about like, what, what was the thought process there? And like, how did you, how did you arrive at that? Yeah. You know, when, when you're a, when you break down a business into its most fundamental parts, their businesses do two things. They make things and they sell things. And that's it. everything else is support, right? Yeah. And uh, when I came in as a strategist, I was a supporting role. And when I took over the, the business unit, you know, I, I, I led some product, but I was doing more sales than product. Um, and so I found myself drifting into the sales part, which um, I can do, but I'm not passionate about and I'm not particularly good at. And so I realized at some point I want to make things. And I spent a little bit of time trying to do that within real self. I sort of explored other ideas and there just wasn't, there wasn't a good fit for me there doing that. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it became very clear to me for a, a number of reasons that uh, moving to Amazon was, was the right next step for me, even if it meant um, sort of navigating a, a, a difficult change in like my title and reporting structure and things like that how like navigating that like title change from like bigger title bigger team probably to more like ic or senior ic role like what do you think helped you make that change because i do like i've talked to a lot of friends that are like more advanced in their career but just realize like hey i don't like the track i'm on like yeah i've done well but i'm not actually happy but but then they often don't switch because there's a lot of things that come with the title, you know, like money, prestige, all sorts of things. And so it feels yeah. very scary and intimidating to to just like start over in some sense. Like, yeah. How did you get comfortable with that? I mean, there were a couple of things that were um, that were determinants. Um, one was, I mean, just full transparency, um, I was trying to move into a product a product adjacent role in in real self but building a, i was going to build us a physical location i was going to build us a um a, 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 store. a place where people could a store yeah um and i was building that store right at the start of covid so i got laid off right 
Um, and so I like that in itself was humbling. Like I didn't actively choose to humble myself necessarily, but as I started looking for other jobs, the ones that felt felt most attract it, it, it freed me up to be able to, um, to be able to take choices that maybe I wouldn't have chosen to do um, just because of my own ego beforehand. Mm. Second thing is I, um, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a two income household and my partner is very successful as well. So I felt safe in, um, and, you know, taking a slightly lower compensation in order to learn a new skill set. Yeah. The third thing for me, um, I think that the, like I was senior in a company nobody's ever heard of, right? And if you look at my resume, there's a lot of companies nobody's ever heard of on that on my resume. And then there's Amazon. And well, um, people know what Parthenon and EY are, I think. <laughs> fair. Yeah, okay. Um, but you know, they know of Bain and McKinsey and TripAdvisor more, right? Sure. And so, um, sorry, give me one second. I thought I turned that off. Um, the 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 ability to go and work at a company that I, I don't know if you could hear that I my my Amazon video conferencing tool was calling me I thought I had stopped it um let me start over the ability to go and work at a company that I had heard of that I knew was well regarded for its product management um, ethos. And specifically, I went to go work on Kindle, specifically on essentially like my all time favorite product was really exciting for me. And so to some extent, I positioned it to myself as like a second, second grad school. Like I was gonna go learn. And it may be a little humbling at the beginning, but look at it as a as a learning opportunity and um and i've learned so much and i feel like such a more equipped professional today not just as a product manager but as a leader um and i i learned a lot of that from amazon so going back like that decision to like you know because like yeah COVID hit your your retail thing whatever it was you were wrong place wrong time yeah. like you could have easily just been like well, I'm a VP with this experience and, you know, some sales and some GM and, and got a, another job like that. But yeah. taking this different tack, would you, if you had to go back, you'd, you'd do the same thing? Yeah. hundred times out of a hundred. It was, um, it, it was, uh, it was probably the best career decision I've ever made. Awesome. And what's next? Yeah, I am. Um, I, Tomorrow, let's see, today is Wednesday. So the day after tomorrow is my last day at Amazon. And it is like incredibly bittersweet for me because I, it, like I said, it is the best job I have ever had. Um, but I'm taking a bet that the next one is even better. Um, I'm going to join a startup um, as the head of product. Shockingly, back in the medical aesthetic space that I came from uh, at Real Self, I never in a million years thought I'd be back there. But a friend of a friend um, hit on a... Um, the, the part of the medical aesthetics industry that I think has the most opportunity for disruption. And, um, and I, I'd been giving them some advice over the years as they were starting to found the business and, and they've, um, they've really started to see some success. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. Super exciting.